In Warhammer 40k, the Space Marines were not the first genetically engineered soldiers that the Emperor of Mankind made. In fact, the Legio Custodes came much earlier and the Thunder Warriors also came earlier. The Thunder Warriors were like the prototype of the Space Marines and they helped the Emperor of Mankind win the Earth during the Unification Wars. However, the Thunder Warriors were flawed. They were prone to genetic abnormality, they were prone to rage and bloodlust, and ultimately their life expectancies weren't very long. Therefore, the Emperor of Mankind needed to have another option, and that option was the Space Marines. Now, in order for the Space Marines to work well, the Emperor needed to have his Primarchs. A lot of fans of 40k believe that the Emperor just saw the Primarchs as tools. However, we learn from Malkador that actually very early on, once the Emperor starts interacting with the babies that are in these incubation pods, that he ends up growing to love the Primarchs a lot. In the early days of the Great Crusade, this was the good time. This was when the Emperor was preparing to go out into the galaxy and he was going to take his Space Marine Legions. They would be led by the Primarchs and they would planet by planet, system by system, unify all the worlds of humanity into the Imperium of Man. With a unified humanity, the Emperor would be able to lead us all to make sure that whatever threats came against us, we would be able to repel them. And it's often thought that the Emperor knew, for example, that the Tyranids would one day come. And the Emperor certainly knew, for example, that the Orcs were actually a great threat to our galaxy. However, a spanner would come into the works. As they were still babies, a warp vortex was created in the laboratory and the Primarchs were dispersed throughout the galaxy. And we actually see what happens here from the perspective of Constantine Valdor. And it's a really cool scene, and so I'm gonna play that for you now. I have speculated on whether things would have been different had I been closer. I believe Malkador feels the same way, and it is a source of guilt for both of us that we were not there. However, the Emperor was at the very heart of it, and if he was unable to intervene successfully, then I must believe that no one could have had the power to prevent what happened. We acted as swiftly as we could. We were like a storm breaking. I summoned all that I could of the Legio, and we travelled to the Forbidden Center. All thoughts of secrecy were gone. In an instant, we tore the skies apart to reach our destination. Malkador came with us, as did Astarte. I can still remember my desperation to be faster. I believe I came as close as I will ever come to knowing fear in those moments. Not for myself, but for something far greater. By the time we arrived, the entire facility was in a state of confusion. The walls were breaking, the roofs were coming down. Buttresses that had taken years to fashion were twisting out of shape under the sudden loads. There were bodies everywhere. Technicians, artificers, mech workers, even custodians had been slain, though by means that I could not understand, for their armor was still intact. We were soon deep underground caked in grey dust and fighting against the darkness and the smoke. The halls were of considerable size. Tens of thousands laboured in that facility, all under a cloak of the most stringent secrecy, and the survivors were panicking, trapped in the corridors like herd animals in a slaughterhouse. The Emperor was not visible to me, but I understood why. The entire structure of that place had been critically damaged, and he was holding it together. Though I could not determine his precise location, without him, the chambers would have by then have been nothing more than choked rubble. It was a strange sensation, moving through a physical volume of space entirely suffused by the Emperor's presence. It was also a reminder to me of his power. Even I need reminders of that from time to time. I saw seasoned soldiers vomiting blood or dashing their heads against the rock. Every lumen was flickering, casting the bloodstains in patterns of failing light. It was hard to breathe, even with our physiology and armor protection. 
It was far worse than Moreland Sen, for this was a place we had carved out ourselves. It was deemed safe, as as any mortal power could make. That was another lesson for us. There are no safe places. It's such a cool scene. In fact, there's a few things that Valdor mentions in that book that I think are going to be really applicable for this story. So the first thing that he says, and I think this often gets overlooked in the Erda conversation, is that at this point, they initially think all the Primarchs are dead. They think there's no way anybody could have survived this. There's basically been a huge explosion in the middle of a bunch of babies. Nobody expects these babies, however impressive that they are, to survive. However, at the end of the book, Malkador reveals that somehow, and you know, realistically, we can expect the Emperor has kind of a really strong connection with his sons, somehow the Emperor knows that the Primarchs have survived, and so the Great Crusade gets properly underway without the Primarchs, just the Space Marines, so that all of his sons can be reunited with him, and ultimately, as we all know, that's what happens. The first thing you'll encounter that kind of covers this scene is False Gods, which is the second book of the heresy. And in that scene, when Horus has been kind of killed on Davin and he's been put into this kind of like trance by the priests of Davin Serpent Lodge, he is shown a vision of the Primarchs as children. He like sees himself. And it was often a thought at the time, maybe this created a causal loop that sent the Primarchs throughout the galaxy. However, in a later novel, uh, which is called First Heretic, I've remembered, uh, then we actually see another situation where Argul Tau and a bunch of the serrated sons from the Word Bearers, they are also shown this kind of vision. And when they go back in time, they see that there's a Geller field around the Primarchs. Now, the reason that's important is because Geller fields in 40k are used to protect ships in the warp. So it's very mysterious that one's here. And he's actually kind of convinced to destroy this Geller field. That would therefore allow, in theory, the Chaos Gods to create the warp vortex, which spread the Primarchs, well, which scattered the Primarchs throughout the galaxy. And that was the law for a very long time. That's what most people believed. And in fact, a lot of people still believe that. And if that is your law, you know, you're perfectly welcome to continue believing it. However, at the end of the Horus Heresy, we get the Siege of Terror. And in the Siege of Terror, we get these incredible characters. You know, we get Sanguinius, the Great Angel, Horus, Heresy, Lupercal, Malkador, the Sigilite. But there is also a guy called John. And John is very important in the Horus Heresy, and he comes up 50 books earlier in Legion. He's part of this long storyline involving the Cabal. He loses his perpetual ability, and ultimately, he comes to Terra to find Elanius Pius, who is an, another very important character who I've discussed before, if you've ever checked out my video on uh, the Dark King. And who is essentially thought to be the oldest human being in existence, the oldest perpetual. Sorry, I should say, John does have a last name, which is Grammaticus. I just always thought it was funny. He was called John. When he gets to Terra, he can't find Elanius Pius, and they were supposed to rendezvous there. Now, he decides to go to an ally of his, another perpetual called Erda. And this is where we get to the meat and potatoes of the topic of today. Erda says in the Siege of Terror, the book Saturnine, that she created the warp vortex that scattered the Primarchs, and we'll explain why later. Now, what's so important there is that, as we learn in the Valdor clip, it's said that the Emperor was in the vicinity when the Primarchs were scattered, and so she is powerful enough that if the Emperor's in the vicinity, she can still create this warp vortex and scatter the Primarchs. That suggests she is of tremendous power, Erda says that she is, like many of the Perpetuals, an old ally of the Emperor. And over time, he kind of sought them all out because he realized that all of these beings were incredibly powerful and could help him in his purpose. And his purpose was basically to kind of save humanity. And she says that the Emperor's ultimate goal is to basically turn all of humanity into perpetuals. 
She actually refers to the Perpetuals as a homo superior, the next stage of human evolution. But interestingly, she also kind of says how there's multiple other Perpetuals that also have this goal. So there are many people who are trying to achieve this over thousands of years. And because they all share this goal, many of them ally with him. Some of them don't, but many of them do. But over time, one by one, all of them eventually kind of betray or leave the Emperor until he's left, as I'm sure everybody knows, with Malkador the Sigilite, who's like his best bro. Now, Erda was one of the final perpetuals left staying loyal to the Emperor. And the reason she betrays him is because he keeps cutting these corners and ultimately, and we don't really know exactly what she sees, but eventually she sees like the true extent of his ambition. She finally sees that not only will the Emperor create a great crusade to kind of unify humanity, but he will stamp out any dissidents. He will destroy empires, which is what we see in the Great Crusade, that are essentially fine on their own. And so she decides that she actually doesn't want that fate for her sons. And she re reveals that she is the mother of the Primarchs as the Emperor is their father. And so not only did the Emperor use her and her, their creation because she's a genius geneticist, but he also uses her DNA as essentially the second most powerful perpetual to create the Primarchs. And importantly, none of the Primarchs seem to be aware of this. Although it's likely that as demons, some of the traitor Primarchs will now know this. So Magnus the Red taunts Jagatai during the heresy, and he says that Jagatai Khan and Fulgrim were originally supposed to be switched. It was supposed to land on opposite worlds. And he says that there was a power that intervened to stop this. And so it could well be the fact that Magnus actually has seen Erda and knows of her existence. There is a difference between the Emperor's goals over time. So originally, the Emperor had all the time in the world. He had tens of thousands of years. Humanity was doing really well. And the Perpetuals were all aligned in this. But over time, as he kind of gains more power and he kind of sees more threats coming to assail humanity. And one of the things the Emperor says in The End and the Death is he says to Sanguinius that Sanguinius's foresight is actually quite a bit better than his. And so the Emperor doesn't see things really clearly. I, I think all the Emperor sees is that there are a series of threats coming to reality, so, um, coming to our galaxy. And so all of a sudden he is trying to rush everything, create the Primarchs. The Primarchs are really a halfway house because they are not true Perpetuals. I know Vulcan is technically a Perpetual, but they're described by Erda, I think, as his artificial Perpetuals. Erda sees him make all these decisions and sees the extent of his ambition to the galaxy and that he's going to be absolutely brutal. And both things can be true. The Emperor could be a benevolent dictator, which is essentially what he is. He is, by definition, you know, the person in charge of the galaxy that tells human beings what to do to go against him is death. That is generally seen as like an evil thing in our society. But we know that the Emperor does this because this is the only way for humanity to survive. And the Imperium is actually not terrible at what it does. It does continually be back these threats that should easily overwhelm it but because it's this w machine churning out soldiers what well, the emperor set up kind of kind of worked but Erda believes that this is just absolutely evil she has kind of like our standards of morality you know she can't see the future so she just sees that he's going to have this kind of ambition and the evil nature to him as she perceives it and she loves her sons very dearly and she just doesn't want her sons to be exterminating human civilizations that are essentially not a threat to the Imperium. I think people are very dismissive of this. People go like, well, if the goal was always to create an Imperium, how can she suddenly turn against that? And it's like, because there's a difference between I want my sons to lead armies that will fight back against the Xenos threats that attack humanity, and I want my sons to lead armies that will destroy perfectly capable human civilizations that live in harmony with other alien races and just absolutely <laughs> annihilate them. And so she doesn't want that for her sons.
How does one become a perpetual? I guess this is one of the things that's really interesting is that the Cabal have this ability to turn humans into perpetuals. And they do it for John Grammaticus, for example. This could come at like a massive sacrifice. So potentially this, this ability doesn't work for most of uh, for the Imperium at a larger scale. But at the same time, they can do it, which is what the Emperor's goal is. So in theory, if they had worked with the Emperor, things might have gone a lot better. But I guess we'll see. Um, it's kind of thought that Eldrad Ulthran approached the Emperor at one point. He kind of implies that he did that. So maybe they did offer. But does Arda have her own unaffiliated Space Marine? She does. So this Space Marine is called Litu. Um, and he's kind of... Yeah, like a Primarchless Space Marine. He wears like the original armor and he's got like a, one of the first bolt guns like ever made. He's a pretty cool guy. Um, and he's still around at this time in the Horus Heresy. So we don't know exactly what happens to him. She's an immortal perpetual who knew about the warp and thought that the Golden Order of the Emperor was less attractive than Chaos. So I don't think it's right. This is what I'm trying to stress. Maybe I need to do this better job of this. I don't think... Erda ever wanted to join Chaos. Now, one thing we're going to talk about in a bit is her interactions with Erebus. Erebus believes she served Chaos inadvertently, but she seems so knowledgeable of Chaos and so understanding of it that I don't believe the Chaos Gods have any sway over her. Now, importantly, as I said earlier, they believe the Primarchs are dead, and I think this plays a big part in Erda's storyline because if she knows that they're going to think the Primarchs are dead potentially the Emperor's just going to leave them this will stop the Great Crusade because there'll be no more without the Primarchs the Space Marines are thought to be unstable and this belief isn't just shared by Erda Astarte also believed this and she's essentially wrong the, the space marines are kind of fine however they do really go off the rails without their primarchs the precursors to the blood angels they were absolutely they were they were giving into the red thirst going absolutely nuts and just rampaging and slaughtering and they were thought to be the most like animalistic of all of the legions they were, it was horrific and so Erda, i think believed that Without the Primarchs, the Space Marines would be unstable. This would delay the Great Crusade, and that would mean that her sons on distant planets would have a chance of some sort of normal life. And she loved her sons, and she knew this wasn't a guarantee. Of course, Angron landed on Nuceria and had an absolutely terrible upbringing. But Angron had a chance at a normal upbringing, like Gilliman did. And it wasn't the worst part ever. Just, just because a character is flawed and just because their decisions are flawed, I don't think makes them a bad character. And I think that's something I'm probably going to stress again later on. Do you think the Emperor grew to love his sons? I personally like the idea that the, the most ruthless being in the galaxy learned too late the joy of being a father, only for the Horus heresy to happen. So, yeah, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that even at the end of uh, Valdor, Birth of the Imperium, Malkador is saying that, you know, after a short amount of time with his sons in their incubation pods, the Emperor couldn't help but love the Primarchs. And he started to refer to them as his sons. And Valdor comments on this. And Valdor says, like, you know, ah, oh, so that's interesting because that means part of the Emperor's humanity is still around. Because it's often thought that the Emperor is completely devoid of humanity, and even the custodians kind of notice this, that he doesn't behave like a normal human. And so, yeah, it's kind of kind of cool that, like, yeah, this, this does come up, that the Emperor starts to love his sons very quickly. I think the idea that the Emperor just sees his sons as tools is one of those things that there's not no evidence for it. I just think he gets kind of overblown. So, for example, he says to Gilliman that Gilliman's a tool. <laughs> He calls him a tool, which is not a very nice thing to call someone, but he calls him many, many things. And essentially, I think it's kind of the ultimate example of tough love. I think it's the Emperor trying to get Gilliman to be what he needs Gilliman to be, which is the Lord Commander of the Imperium. And the other example is in Master of Mankind, we see the Emperor have a conversation with Arkan Land, and he's, you know, refers to um Angron, sorry, um, as like a tool, and he refers to him as the what the world is the 12th he refers to him as the 12th and so people take that as like this idea of oh well clearly the emperor just kind of sees his sons as tools and he doesn't actually love them but actually he's talking to arkan land and he's talking to arkan land in a way that land will understand because land is rather heartless and a 
priest of Mars. So the Empress is talking to him in that respect. If the baby Primarchs were sent into the warp, how did Big E create the legions of space marines based on their Primarchs? So the huge quantities of the data around the Primarchs is destroyed. And they say that like no more could be created at this point. However, not all of the genetic stock is destroyed. So a lot of it survives. And so with that, they are able to create the space marine legions. They just can't create more Primarchs. Do you do law Q&As often? I try to stream every week and I basically try, I don't know how well this works, but they seem to be reasonably popular. I basically try to make a video, but at the same time do a Q&A. So I have a series of notes on Erda and so I'm going to go through those, but I also do a Q&A at the same time, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, the actual stream will end up being like a couple of hours, but I can normally trim that down to like, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, that will be a reasonably coherent and rewatchable video in the future. Um, for a guy made of sand, you have a magnificent voice. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, the burden I live with. I saw a video earlier today that said Astarte and Erda should have been the same character, and I agree. That is a really interesting take. So I do kind of agree with this. So Astarte was mentioned in the Valdor clip that you saw earlier. Now, the reason that's interesting is because Astarte and Erda kind of have the same storyline. Now, in a way, that makes sense because, as Erda explains, all of the perpetuals over time basically kind of see that the emperor is you know going to be this tyrant and they kind of like abandon him and betray him etc well that's what they believe at least and so the fact that Erda sees it and then later Astarte sees it kind of makes sense Astarte isn't really a perpetual I don't think that we know of but she's a geneticist so she can kind of just live forever because she can yeah just keep extending her lifespan although she doesn't do anything to make herself look younger as it's, it's said that so, so she always looks old in the Valdor book anyway but yeah I do think it might have been simpler um Although I guess they needed a second reason to explain what happened to the Thunder Warriors. So yeah, they, that's kind of why. But there is a lot of similarities between their story that I can understand why you'd want them consolidated. Uh, also, we don't really get a lot on either of them. So combining the two and getting one deeper character would have been more interesting. Biggie suffers from the fact that so many different authors with so many different interpretations of him I mean, that's always going to be the case. But I think it's actually one of those things where all of these things can be true. So like Master of Mankind is like a, probably the best example where Master of Mankind probably gives you the most detailed description of the Emperor that we've ever had. And yet, if you read the afterword of that book, I think it's in, I think it was, it might have been in an interview, I can't remember, where ADB, he talks about how in that book, he doesn't actually introduce anything new. He only uses existing law to talk about the Emperor. I came into 40k during Nurgle's Blessing. A lot of people did. <laughs> uh, Eighth Ed and like that, new stuff is coming out. Do old fans generally like getting new material? Well, this, I mean, Urda is a really good example there where people come at it from different ways. A lot of people don't like the newer lore because they prefer older lore and things get retconned. A lot of people don't like that a lot of the mysteries of the setting are explained. So some people have like that fundamental issue with the Horus Heresy. So a lot of people think that the Horus Heresy should have remained this kind of like mythology of the setting. And, you know, a lot of the things that are said could be completely false. They could be completely true. They could be based in truth. We don't know. But now we kind of have it in cold, hard facts. So, for example, a lot of people today have asked, like, you know, what does the emperor think of his sons? Does he love his sons? Does he think of his sons as tools? We'll probably be able to answer that question in like a few months time because we'll have the second and third. Um, it said the third one is out like early next year. Um, end of the death novel. And when that happens, I mean, fundamentally, we're going to see, was it true that the emperor couldn't bring himself to kill Horus Lupercal despite how evil Horus had become just because the emperor loved his son? It's kind of hard to make the case that he just sees the Primarchs as tools if he can't bring himself to kill his own son because you know even because given the fact that horus has become absolutely abhorrent by this point by the standards of the emperor so it's certainly a mixed thing the emperor did not originally wish to be worshipped as a god but in light of the chaos gods being very real did the emperor consider that he may have just transcended and become an actual god so yeah so i think to dan abnett spoken about this where 
essentially, I think his belief, and this doesn't make it canon, I should clarify, like Dan Abner is pretty clear on that, just because he thinks this is the way the Emperor's works doesn't mean that's the way it does work, because he they try to write these things as open-ended as possible without a definitive answer, but it's a good reference point. Uh, he believes that the Emperor never wanted to be a god, but given his current state, will be whatever humanity kind of needs him to be. So if he needs to act like a god to save humanity, he'll do that because his ultimate purpose is to serve the human race. So that's what the Emperor kind of believes. Man, your memory is really good. I read a bunch of these recently and you are on point. Oh, thank you, man. I mean, it's very hard to have... It's very... <laughs> this is the... I think this is probably the reason other law people don't do this is because it's very hard to remember everything accurately. And if I say anything inaccurately, I get hit hard in the comments. So um, I'll be honest, if you, if you listen to these streams, I'm literally telling you what I remember from like 100 books at once. So I might get the odd thing wrong. I am very sorry. It's just it's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, I, I do my best. I do try to prep the streams so I get as much right as possible. If you're up for it, law Q and A might be the thing to try. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, you know, like it's, like the previous comment was saying, it can be really hard. Like if someone's like, "Oh, what do you think about, you know, the Carcharodons in this respect?" I'll be like, "I haven't read the Carcharodon books in like six years." So you're pushing you're pushing me pretty hard at that point. Do you think the competence or ability of the emperor is lessened by others accomplishing feats that were once his own? Uh, I think the Emperor back in the day wasn't as strong as people believe. The Wolf of Ash and Fire is a storyline set during the Great Crusade. The Emperor is very nearly killed by a giant mech orc warlord. That shows you a how strong the orcs can be, but also the Emperor back then, there's a big difference in the power level between the Emperor then and the Emperor now. The Emperor was not infallible and he could be killed. So I definitely think it's possible the emperor's previous uh, acts could have been replicated in 40k but the emperor now is, is a lot more than that it's 10 10 000 years is a long time to be charged by batteries hey sam man love your videos mate thank you man i really appreciate that, that kind of thing would thanks for the um super chat um zombie fight uh would valdor be the child of erda I'm not sure her name no he, he wouldn't be we know that uh Valdor had like his own parents and we know that he kind of predated the rest of the Primarchs by quite some bit so uh he's not a Primarch in that sense but he, he might weirdly have had like the title of Primarch because Primarch was just a title during the Unification Wars so like the senior Thunder Warriors were called Primarch but they're not like our Primarchs in 40k they are just the senior Thunder Warriors so he might have been called Primarch back in those days my boy John so John Grammaticus in the Siege of Terror. And he says to Arda that he wants to try and get to Alanius Pius. And they have a big conversation around the Emperor and whether the Emperor is good. John Grammaticus has been aware of who uh, Arda is apparently for a long time. And he's also been made aware of some of her actions. He seems to know that she scattered the Primarchs. Now, I'm going to go through some quotes from Arda now. And we can take a look at what it is that she says about the emperor and what we can extrapolate from this. And also whether the other law we have corroborates this or whether it allows this or whether it, quite frankly, you know, this kind of thing can't be true. So one of the things about Erda's storyline that's really interesting is that the emperor doesn't kill her. The emperor allows her to leave the imperial palace and essentially live out the rest of her life in basically safety. You imagine the emperor as basically a pretty vengeful creature. It's said that when the Primarchs are scattered that he did rage for a long time and the emperor raging, we can only imagine how terrifying that is, but he never seeks revenge on Erda. The reason for that might be a pretty simple reason, which is that he loves Erda. And this has been pretty commonly speculated about her. So she has a lot of information on the Emperor that suggests she has a very personal connection with him. She describes him as very funny. She describes him as very intelligent. And despite the fact that she betrayed him, she still kind of admires and loves him in that respect. She also knows if not his true name, a name that he went by very often, which is Neoth. She says that she knew him as Neoth when he was younger. 
he took many names throughout the years, but that was the one he always used with her. Now, we don't really know whether that's going to be his original name, but we do know that um, he took many names over the years and he took on many roles. So one of the things that the end and the death hints at is this idea that the emperor has been people like Alexander the Great and he's taken on various roles over time. Perhaps the emperor was even various messiahs and religious figures throughout history. You know, I don't think Games Workshop would ever go ahead and say that for certain, but I think it's pretty likely that he has taken on a multitude of roles over the millennia. After the emperor allows Erda to leave, she refuses to leave. You know, she still calls the earth earth and she says it's her home and would still like to live there. And she's pretty far away from the imperial palace, so she doesn't really run into him. So, John Grammaticus says to Erda that the emperor cannot win. The sons you made with him are going to burn the world and they will come for you once he is gone. They are not as you remember them. The warp has taken most of them, even the best of them. They will show you no mercy, no affection, no sentiment, no filial duty. They probably won't even know you. And if they do, it will be to hate you as they hate him. You have to go. She refuses to leave. And interestingly, she really does seem to show like a mother's love for her sons. She seems to have no intention to kind of renounce her sons she still loves them very dearly she says even after what they've become she still loves them which is quite a claim because if you've seen angron you'll know that angron is pretty terrifying at this point in time and it's not exactly a face that many could love i'd imagine but she still loves him Erda also is asked by john does she know why the emperor never came for her and she doesn't know. She doesn't know why the Emperor never came to kill her. John Grammaticus also asks her in Saturnine, why didn't you kill the Emperor? Or why didn't all of the Perpetuals try and like gang up and kill the Emperor? Because so many of them kind of turned their back on him over the centuries that surely it wouldn't have been a big ask for them to kind of overpower him. And she says that the Emperor is so powerful that he is essentially more powerful than all of the other perpetuals put together. And that's obviously a terrifying thought because, as we'll see later, Erda herself is monstrously powerful. One of the questions that people have often is, does this law undo a lot of old law? And one of the things that the Saturnine storyline seems to undo is the old law of the emperor. And if you're not familiar... The origin of the emperor, I should say, was connected to a series of ancient shamans. And we're going to go through that storyline now. Even back then, it is mythology. It's not thought to be directly canon, but interpreted from the real events. However, Erda kind of implies that the emperor is just a perpetual. So can this be true? As human numbers increased and human civilization grew away from its natural roots, the particular warp energies created by humans began to dominate the warp. Where the energies of nature were harmonious and benign, those of man were often disharmonious and dangerous. Power, ambition, greed, lust and a thousand other human feelings took root in the warp and began to grow. As the thoughts and emotions of men became stronger, the natural rhythms of the warp were disrupted and became less accessible to the shamans. Inevitably, the process of the civilization severed mankind's links with the natural forces of the warp and created new ones based upon his own character. In time, these disharmonious forces were to grow into the chaos powers. The Emperor was born while the rhythm of the warp still flowed strongly through all natural things. The old shamans were guided by the warp and in their turn guided their people. But even then, the growing power of humanity was beginning to make itself felt, and the shamans feared that their knowledge and whole way of life would eventually pass away. The energies they depended upon were becoming increasingly difficult to tap, Worst of all, they were losing their ability to reincarnate. 
For as long as anyone could remember, when a shaman died, his soul had flown into the warp and bathed in its energies, awaiting renewal in another body. Now the souls were being best, chased and consumed by the malignant chaos powers. Terrified for the future of their race, all the shamans of Earth gathered in one place and began the longest and most important debate in the history of humanity, lasting centuries and leading to the birth of the new man. After hundreds of years of debate and research, the shamans came to the conclusion that they were doomed and that without them, the whole race would soon fall prey to the psychic entities it had created in the warp. At the same time, the disruption of the natural rhythm of the warp would result in the inevitable decline of the whole planet. They divined a future where all of creation would be consumed by mankind's greed and ambition. Although their own power was still strong, the shamans realized that they could survive for only one or two further incarnations. They were not men to accept death easily. Many of them could remember the dawn of their race, when in other bodies they had walked under African skies. Having survived so long, for millions of years, it was not their way to die without hope or purpose. They therefore decided to pool their own energies by reincarnating in a single body. In their thousands they swallowed poison, and in their thousands they died, and their kind was gone from the earth. Within a year, the man later to be known as the Emperor was born. As he grew older, his powers began to manifest themselves, and he gradually remembered the thousands of lives that lay behind him. He was the new man, but he was also the best. His powerful mind could still sift the natural energies of the warp, enter the lives of plants and animals, promote harmony, and ease the suffering of others. And he remembered how he was made to live forever, so that he would never have to reincarnate, but would survive unchanged for eternity. At last, he remembered everything that had led up to his birth, and he left his own people to begin his endless journey around the world and through human history. So this is the original storyline of the Emperor. This idea that he is this ancient being formed from a bunch of very powerful beings committing suicide at once and their souls returning to the warp and then kind of binding and being fused into one soul creating the Emperor. And this is very old lore from Warhammer 40k and you know when we talk about the kind of the controversies around new lore you know, this is one of the bigger ones because she basically kind of just says that the Emperor is just another perpetual. From the earliest days of his life, he did what we all did. He saw his own power and tried to use it. He tried to steer mankind towards a better future. He tried to raise the human race up to achieve its potential. And of course, because of his power, he was rather more effective than most of us. John... I tell you truly, I have lived a long life, and I have no idea what perpetuals are. I am one, and I don't know. There are theories, and some of them convincing. The one I favour is that we are the next version of the human species. Throughout history, the human species has reproduced along fairly neurotypical and physiotypical lines. The standard mortal, human, flawed, and wonderful but there are outliers. In every generation, there are anomalies, non-heterosic mutations, people born with unusual gifts or traits, unusual skills. The most obvious, I suppose, would be the Psyker. That's how species evolve, John. That's how they progress. Rogue variations to the genetic norm, sometimes in response to environmental factors, some of those mutations are failures and die out. Some are advantageous, a longer beak, a stronger jaw, an opposable thumb. Mutations born with those advantages tend to survive. They pass their genes along and their offspring share that advantage. Longer beaks and stronger jaws become the new norm. Now that's obviously a very large difference compared to the emperor was formed from many shamans sacrificing themselves at once 
and being reformed into a very powerful being. Her explanation is that the Emperor basically just has a very, very strong jaw and a very, very longer beak, along with some other evolutionary adaptions. Don't get me wrong, that does make a lot of sense, but I think it doesn't actually mean that the Emperor's alternative is impossible. So what I believe is that both are essentially true. I believe the Emperor is a perpetual, but I choose to believe that the Emperor's origin is that he is this being formed from you know, a gigantic ritual, essentially, because that's the only thing that explains to me why he is so much more powerful than the rest of the perpetuals. She, you know, refers to the perpetuals as just like a homo superior, but I don't think that really does justice to what the emperor is in Warhammer 40k. The next thing I want to talk about that she speaks to John about is actually... Alanius Pius. So she refers to John uh, uh, to Alanius Pius as the oldest of all the perpetuals, and he was always a man of faith, for he was born in an age when God seemed real. He was never able to shake off the religiosity of his birth culture. Alanius didn't believe that perpetuals should meddle in the affairs of man. He thought the guidance of the human race was God's work alone. So he stepped aside and lived his life over and over never taking part. He wasn't the only one. So this is not actually correct, according to Alanius Pius himself. So he didn't always believe that the perpetuals shouldn't meddle in the affairs of man. In fact, it's said that Alanius Pius was the first war master of the emperor. Now again, he does eventually betray the Emperor in a story around the Lightning Tower, which is something I've spoken about in a previous video. But at the same time, he did at one point follow the Emperor. He did obey the Emperor's commands. Now, certainly, he betrays the Emperor and runs away, but that wasn't always his standpoint. GW tries to paint Erebus as a badass villain, and he is now just in fighting to lead the word bearers. One of the things that <laughs> Erebus talks about when he actually fights, after he fights Erda, is he talks about this idea that he's actually quite content <laughs> in the world. He's maybe the most content human being in existence because he's kind of done everything he set out to do. He believes he's the true architect of chaos. And yeah, the chaos gods haven't really properly punished him yet. He's been brought back to life a couple of times. He kind of thinks he's winning at life, really. It's kind of hard to argue with him because everything he does works very annoyingly. Is there any part of the law implying the Emperor was Jesus? There's nothing that direct. I, <laughs> I imagine Games Workshop will let you leave it up to your imagination, but I, I don't think they'd ever be that direct. Um, there's already a lot of uh, parallels with the story of Sanguinius, so I think Games Workshop probably won't want to offend people. Um, Erda was Fremen. Uh, she's not Fremen, but Erda does get a description. She's said to have piercing blue eyes. That's why I edited the photo to have blue eyes. <laughs> but yeah, she's just like a woman. In this form, she has various forms, as we'll look at later. One of the things that Erda also talks to John about is what the Emperor was doing throughout his history. And we get more of an idea of this during the, um, the End and the Death, where it's said that the Emperor was various people throughout history. However, Erda says that the Emperor often did take on the role as like a warlord and a king. And this is something that was always kind of implied i think in warhammer 40k law but it's good to have it definitively because it was also often said that he kind of operated in the shadows of the human race for thousands of years and then properly rose up during the unification wars and, and a very common question people have is was the emperor doing stuff during the dark age of technology and in truth we don't really know but maybe he was maybe he did have various prominent roles but he just didn't officially declare himself self as being a perpetual, as being, you know, the emperor of mankind. He doesn't take on that name for a long, long time. Malkador actually suggests he take on that name. But uh, he certainly is a king in ancient times, has various goals and objectives to achieve throughout history. We know about him going to the gate at Molech. We know about him trying to understand the language of Annuncia because that will grant him incredible power. Um, however, everything kind of changes over time, according to Erda, because the Emperor starts to foresee a lot of the dangers that are coming for humanity. 
He had a greater understanding of the universe than anyone. Such was his power. He saw the dangers of the warp, the fragility of humanity, the recurring flaws of our species, credulity, anger, false faith, yearning, everything that was terrible and also wonderful about humanity. When I met him, he had already begun on his path to shepherd mankind towards a brighter future. I believed in him, John. I adored him. Most of us did. It was hard not to love him, and hard not to be in awe of him. Harder still to perceive the dangers of his ambition. He wanted to achieve what most of us dreamed of, and he had the will and power to do it. Not just do it, but do it faster and more completely than any perpetual could. He had the means to accelerate our efforts and accomplish, in just a few generations, what might otherwise take millions of years. Over time, he located and tried to recruit every single perpetual on Earth. Some of us joined him, others decided not to. Some of us fought him. Several of the greatest conflicts in world history were caused by rival perpetuals trying to thwart his program. He prevailed. There were eras when he was badly set back. Over time, disaffection grew among our kind. Even the best of us could barely keep up, and I think he resented that. He is quite ruthless, and he is astoundingly arrogant. I suppose it would not be hard to be if you were him. He was always right. He never looked for advice or counsel. He reshaped the world and drove it forward, and he would not be questioned on the merit of his plan. To do so was heresy. This is where we start to see like a big change in the emperor. And although there were perpetuals that stood up against him, over time they all start to abandon the emperor because he starts seemingly to be cutting corners and doing things that the other perpetuals don't agree with. And I think what Erd is kind of implying here is that it's his knowledge of the warp, his understanding of chaos and what I think to be kind of like visions of like Tyranids and Orcs and Necrons one day rising up that kind of frighten the Emperor and he, and he realizes that there's a time limit on what he can accomplish for humanity. And so um, yeah, that's why he kind of steps things up and eventually all of the Perpetuals abandon the Emperor and uh, only, you know, Malkul the Sigilite ends up remaining. So there we go. Erda talks about how she was the one that scattered the Primarchs now, interestingly, this is known by Eldrad Ulthran, apparently, and so it would be interesting to see whether Eldrad might tell Gilliman, because we know they talk in Warhammer 40k. However, we get an interesting insight into why Erda does this, and I think it's kind of the fundamental part of her character to understand whether what she did had any kind of merit to it. Because I think most people in the community dismiss her actions pretty easily because people think well i mean fundamentally she kind of caused all the primates to go through this horrific turmoil or at least most of them and if it wasn't for her angron would have never got the butcher's nails he would have never become this big rampaging red beast in theory but she does have a really solid explanation for why she did what she did she thinks she does so let's just take a quick look at that my fundamental objection to neoth's great work is his haste and urgency, to supplant the natural flow of life with an artificial version that tramples ethics and morality and wise prudence. Artificial perpetuals, John. That was his plan. And look, see how it worked. And John, earlier you chided me and my kind for not taking action. You called us derelict that we had not made a concerted effort to block Neoth's progress and that we should feel ashamed that you, a fake and neophyte immortal, should be doing what we should have long since done. You are an artificial perpetual too, in a way, John, or at least you were. I have no reason to trust your judgment, for you, like him, and like my poor accursed children, are trying to hasten the movement of fate. So Erda goes on to talk about what happened after that, and over time the Emperor decided to make the Primarchs. And she says that he, the Emperor couldn't make them alone and that she made them with him. I was still with him then, one of the last few, 
Me, my colleague Estati, a few others. I had misgivings, we all did, but he was very convincing. Compelling, and by then, he had become more powerful than ever. He needed a geneticist to work with him, and that was my aunt. And he needed a biological source, a gene stock rare enough to mix with his own, a perpetual. I was the other source, a genetic donor. He is the father of mankind. I am the surrogate mother. We made twenty fine sons. But he allowed me no influence. I was just a biological instrument, and once they were born, I began to properly understand the future he had prepared for them. The bitter destiny. The aggressively rapid and unnaturally savage evolutionary jumpstart he was driving towards. No good ever comes of coercing nature, John. Through his sons, he would force the human race into the future, force it into submission, and defy the warp to do it. He had built artificial perpetual analogues and weaponized them, readying to resist the unbending cosmos. He was planning a crusade to retake the stars, to claim back in a bloody century or two what had taken millennia to lose in the first place. That was when I stepped away too. I was heartbroken and bereft, but I stepped away. Not quite, said John. This part I know, Eldrad told me. You didn't just step away, Erda. You tried to stop him. I tried to save my sons. You scattered them. She sat forward and stared at the ground, her hands across her mouth. I did. I took them from him. I cast them onto the ties to spare them from his terrible ambition. That's Erda's official explanation of why she scattered the Primarchs. I know it doesn't satisfy everyone, but I think it is an important explanation because there are many things that the Emperor did over time that officially changed her perception of him and whether he is someone to be followed. So the first is he started to increase the speed at which he was trying to accomplish his aims and he was cutting corners and his attempts to achieve them. Then he starts to subvert nature and create an artificial version of the perpetuals that won't work well with the natural flow of life. And she finds this a bit of an abomination, as I think a lot of people do throughout history, even today, when it comes to talking about kind of genetic engineering, etc. These things are really controversial. And I think there's an important difference between creating a natural perpetual and creating something artificial. And then the final thing that the Emperor does to kind of really spurn Erda is he apparently makes it very clear to her that she will have no influence over her sons, that he will not allow her to, to raise her sons, essentially, and she loves them dearly. And she basically realizes at this point that the Primarchs are not going to be generals that will lead humanity's forces to reunite the worlds of humanity and defend from alien races. They will persecute everyone where possible, including human empires, working with Xenos, and a myriad of other things. And that's her reasoning. Now, I think that the very common complaint that you hear is people going like, you know, is it surprising that this was his aim? You know, he is essentially a warlord by any definition of the word. And I can understand that argument. I really can, because you know, fundamentally, he, he's already trying to create a genetic version of humans that are going to be above and beyond um, everyone else, and he's going to leave everyone else behind. He's already going to try and, you know, unify the worlds of humanity. That's going to lead to war. The Primarchs were designed specifically to have this purpose for war. The Lion was the first Primarch designed, and his job is extermination, as I've looked at in a previous video. So, like, it's unlikely that she had no sign of this. But it was a very gradual understanding that Erda had when it came to the true nature of the emperor. Well, the nature that she believes the emperor has. And ultimately, she turns against him. That's actually it from Saturnine. So I did just want to cover what um, happens to Erda because that's basically the main storyline that we get with Erda in Saturnine. There's a bunch of other things that are covered, which uh, I recommend you read, but those are the main things I wanted to talk about. However, after that, she appears in the book Warhawk. And when we see her again, we see her facing down Erebus. Erebus, uh, the 
least liked character in 40k some would say it's a tough title but he's certainly up there he is the instigator for the entire horus heresy in many ways he is unlike most characters that are corrupted by chaos in that from what we know of Erebus, he was never a good guy. He was always a bad guy, and he considers himself the architect of chaos. And seemingly, this has actually kind of paid off for Erebus, because one of the things that Warhawk makes pretty clear is that Erebus is one of the few people to actually know about the existence of Erda. And Erebus talks about the Chaos Gods like they've let him know about this threat because he needs to accomplish this kind of secret aim for them. And they don't want the Demon Primarchs to know about her. It's described as like Erda and the other Perpetuals are this external fact to the Emperor, but they could absolutely have a strong impact on the future of the Imperium going forward. And so the Chaos Gods don't want to leave that up to chance. They want to make sure that the Perpetuals are dealt with. Eleni is pious, and John Grammaticus, though he's not a Perpetual anymore, they're on their way to the Vengeful Spirit, and they are potentially going to be a defining factor in the final book. So... It's an understandable precaution to take by the Chaos Gods, but it's interesting to see them kind of planning things out this thoroughly. Anyway, the Chaos Gods have decided that Erda needs to be dealt with, and so they send Erebus there. And Erebus actually summons four greater demons to fight against her, which is a very impressive feat. I'm going to go through that fight now because it's a very cool scene. We get to see just how powerful Erda is. It was at that point that he saw her many selves emerge, cycling rapidly like overlaid frames of a confused vid animation. He saw a woman taking on the demons, her dark skin as hard as the staff she twisted around her, in her impressive anger, majestic at the apex of a long life. He saw a youth, vital as starlight, fast as the racing waters, slender limbs wielding a sickle that flashed under the blood moon. And he saw a crone, withered black like an olive, hard as twisted tree roots, freezing everything she clutched with long knuckled fingers. All of them were deadly, all of them were her, switching rapidly from image to image, never settling, as if an eternity of evolution had been jumbled up and replayed over and over, provoked into being by this violation of the desert sanctuary the place where past, present, and future merged into a kind of arid timelessness. So there we see Arda split into three different people, essentially, and it's described as like images overlaying with each other. So she has this power to seemingly kind of split into three different beings and use those to fight against these greater demons. And Erebus actually sees this and he gets worried for a bit. He tried to intervene, to wade into the great clash of god aspects, but the sandstorm pushed him back, burning his flesh with its howling pressure. The entire crater seemed to be coming apart around them, its concentric rings cracking and tumbling, with detritus caught up in the maelstrom and sent sailing around the epicenter. He was losing his footing. She cried aloud, and Erebus heard three voices overlaid, all of them enraged and in pain. The beasts were shrieking in their turn, wounded to their hateful hot cores by the power she unloaded at them. He saw the cadaver staggering, its loose flesh ripped from the exposed bone. He saw the serpent crushed under a disdainful heel, and the bull creature sense reeling from the staff's tip. The vile bird, with the translucent plumage in every hue of an outlandish spectrum, jabbed in close only to have its feathers plucked from its hide and its eyes pulled out with a deft flick of the sickle. Blood started to enter the vortex of whirling matter, gobbets of it, some truly human, some just a cheap copy. Erebus caught glimpses of real pain amid the fury, a wince from the woman, a gasp from the crone. The twine was unravelling, severed in many places now, the quicksand sucked at them all, bubbling under the bloodied feet. She could have been magnificent, Erebus thought to himself. She could have been the queen of the war. He smiled ruefully, capable of pride even as the world around him shook into oblivion. But I have stamped on another scorpion, 
And now the desert is almost free of its sting. Praise be to me. So Erda actually does defeat these chaos beings. However, she doesn't have enough energy left, very sadly, to kill Erebus. And Erebus walks over to her and offers her the chance to join him. He actually says to her, worship me, smiling at her. And she spits at him. And they do have kind of this back and forth. And this is another thing that's debated often is, was she manipulated by the chaos gods? Because Erebus believes that she is. And Erda's like, no, I'm not. I'm not manipulated by the chaos gods. Because she's actually very well aware of the chaos gods and knows what they are. She knows that they are these beings created in the warp from human emotions, essentially. And so while she knows they're very powerful, she says that, like, you know, he worships nothing. And so that's it for Erda. Erda rejected the emperor. She rejected the chaos gods. Um, she lived out in the desert. She lived far away from the imperial palace. And uh, ultimately, we never got to see her interact with any of the Primarchs, which I always think was a missed opportunity. Um, in my opinion, I think that Erda is not as right about everything as she thinks she is because she doesn't seem to understand Alanius Pius. A lot of the Emperor's actions, I think, in hindsight, we know to be correct. And it's interesting that she describes the Emperor as always correct, but then still argues against him. It seems like a really interesting position to take. But I love a flawed character. So I did actually really like her introduction. I thought it was kind of cool having this kind of softer side to the origins of the Primarchs. But what I didn't like was that she dies in the next book that we see her. And um, when she does die, I didn't say this, but she's killed by an Athaim dagger. And... The question also has to be asked, is she actually dead? Because Erebus kills her with an Athaim dagger. And the Athaim is this sword that you see here. It's the sword that Erebus gave to Yugen Temba, which allowed him to basically wound Horus Lupercal in such a way that he had to be revived on Davin and Kefort's Chaos. Anyway, the Athaim is the sword and gets smashed and the shards are turned into daggers. And the daggers play a bit of a role in the heresy. Gilliman ends up finding a bunch of them. Anyway, they're very, very powerful. For example, Erebus and Alanius Pius, they use them to basically travel across the galaxy. You can kind of cut a tear in reality and make kind of like a very randomized warp jump across the galaxy. It's very dangerous. That's why Alanius Pius isn't there when John Grammaticus arrives on Terra. Anyway, as powerful as these daggers are, to my knowledge, it's never actually said that these things can kill perpetuals. Because there's a whole storyline in Unremembered Empire around the Fulgrite dagger. Now, the Fulgrite dagger in 40k is a very powerful thing. When the Emperor is fighting, he's fighting with all of his lightning. If his lightning strikes sand, then just as when lightning strikes sand, you get glass when the emperor's lightning strikes and you get fulgrite it contains some of the emperor's power and that's what the fulgrite is it's like a a bit of the emperor's power so it's a very important plot device in the horus heresy earlier on it's ultimately used to cure vulcan from his madness after he's driven insane by conrad kurtz but the reason it's so important is because it's said multiple times it's like one of the only things that can kill a perpetual now, to my knowledge, I don't think it's ever said that an Athame dagger can actually kill a perpetual. So I think this is just one of those things they never properly explain. But ultimately, Arda does die. She ends up being killed by Erebus and she never really shows any remorse for any of her actions that she took during the uh, long life that she led. And it's quite surprising, really, that someone could create Angron, create Conrad Kurz, know what they've become, and not even feel bad. But I guess we've all got our faults. Ultimately, she did seem to love her children very, very much. And I guess that's always admirable. And it seems that the Emperor really loved her because he never had her brutally killed, despite the fact that she betrayed him. But thanks very much for watching this stream. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I And I will see you next time.